I try to say this in every PC build video I make. Building a computer is not that difficult. Take it from someone who learned the same way many of you are right now. Videos like this can go a long way when done correctly. No pressure. The build tutorial you're about to see will culminate into a very small form factor computer that isn't much larger than an Xbox One console. It will, however, be much more powerful. All the parts used in this build guide are linked in the video description, by the way, so check those out if you're interested in building something very similar. Let's start off with a walkthrough of all the components we'll be using. First up, our processor. KB Lake is brand new, granted IPC gains over Skylake are awfully small. Nonetheless, we've got the best i5 money can buy, and it'll be the CPU used in this build. Four cores, four threads, a turbo boost of 4.2 GHz, and an unlocked multiplier, specs worthy of modern high-end gaming without a doubt. As for the motherboard, I'd like to give a huge shout out to ASRock for their willingness to send over one of the most beautiful ITX boards I've ever seen. This is the Fatality Z270 Gaming ITX motherboard equipped with onboard Wi-Fi, an overclockable chipset, an excellent aesthetic, full surround sound and optical support, six USB 3.0 ports, USB Type-C Thunderbolt 3, pretty much anything you could possibly want and expect in a high-end ITX gaming motherboard. Oh, and it doesn't break the bank either. For RAM, G-Skill sent over two 8 gb sticks of DDR4 capable of a 3.6 GHz frequency. We'll definitely verify this with our board. These Trident Z modules are drop-dead gorgeous, come in a variety of colors, including RGB now, and are very well built by one of the most reliable memory manufacturers on the planet. I can say that with certainty. Our CPU cooler is a Cryorig C7, my favorite ITX cooler. It's no larger than a stock Intel or AMD cooler, but keeps temps nice and cool even when overclocked, all the while maintaining a very quiet profile. Installation is also quick and painless, as you'll see shortly. Our graphics card choice is an AMD RX 484GB graphics card, it's a reference model. These reference coolers are preferable in tight spaces, they keep the heat away from other components in the cramped space, vital for us seeing as though we'll be overclocking both our CPU and GPU. If the RX 480 isn't your cup of tea, I recommend either a GTX 1060 or 1070, but wouldn't go for anything less than about a $200 graphics card. Below that point, our 7600K would become pointless. You could opt for a pricey GTX 1080 as well, it's entirely up to you and how much you willing to spend. Just make sure dimensions are satisfactory for the case you'll be using. Installation apart from that will be identical. For storage, I've opted for a 500 gigabyte Samsung 850 Evo. This is discretionary as well. I personally recommend at least half a terabyte though. You may even want more. You can also choose any reliable SSD you'd like. They're all the same size and feature the same interfaces. Toshiba, Samsung, Adata, PNY, and SanDisk are all brands I've used myself and have had no problems with. Lastly, our case and power supply. The Fractal Node 202 is a beautiful ITX case with conservative appeal and an ideal layout. I recommend purchasing one with the included Integra 450 watt SFX power supply. Just makes things easier and you can often find the combo at a decent discount. Full size ATX PSUs will not fit in the Node 202, but there are other small form factor cases similar in size that are equipped with this support. So there are your components. Again, you can find them linked in the video's description if you're interested in building something similar. Before moving on though, I recommend connecting all of these parts to verify that they work prior to building inside the case. You can follow along and exclude the case installation if you'd like to run through the checklist. Always a pain to have to remove and reinstall components in the case, assuming something is DOA. Now let's move on to the tutorial. Start by placing your motherboard on its box. Unhinge the retention arm, securing the CPU socket, and lift up the door. Double check that all pins are aligned and not bent in any way. See this video here if you're interested in how to fix bent CPU pins. But don't ask. Now remove your CPU from its box, being careful not to touch the contacts below or the heat spreader above. Skin oils can interfere with the heat transfer. Align the golden arrow on the CPU with the small arrow on the socket. You can also use the small indentions up top as guides. Gently rest the CPU in the socket without applying force, ensuring that it sits flat and unobstructed. Now lower the retention arm and lock the socket door back in place. The plastic cover should snap off on its own. Remove it and store it in your motherboard's box in case an RMA is in order. Next comes CPU cooler installation. Pull out your Cryrig C7 and set the backplate along with the four included nuts to the side for now. On the bottom side of the cooler should be a plastic warning label covering the base. Remove this before installing. Don't leave this on there. That would be quite catastrophic. Cryrig includes thermal paste with the C7, by the way. Open it and spread a small amount atop the center of the CPU lid, no larger than the size of a pea. Now funnel the four legs of the C7 through the four holes on the motherboard cornering the CPU socket. Flip the motherboard over and take note of the screw locations poking through the board from the cooler itself. Mark the holes on the back plate labeled 115X and run these four points over the cooler's threads. Use 
use of the four nuts to secure the back plate to the cooler. Refer to the Quarig manual for additional clarification. It can be a bit tricky to uh, explain this via video. Once secured, connect the four pin fan cable on the C7 to the header on the motherboard labeled CPU fan. The last major component required by the motherboard is system RAM. Pull down on the latches of each RAM slot, align the indentions on the dims with the notches in the slots themselves, and force each module into place starting with the ends that don't have latches. It'll make it much easier. You should hear clicks on each side by the way. You can double check that both are installed correctly by hopping into your BIOS after the building process if you're unsure. Now it's time to open the Node 202 and install this core of our build. Four screws underneath hold the roof in place. Remove these and set the cover aside for now. Install your motherboard's IO shield into the long rectangular door at the back of the case. Start from one corner and work your way around. Can be a bit painful and time consuming. It, you get used to it after a while. Now slide your motherboard gently into the case using the four standoffs and the rear IO shield as guides. You can use the Cryrig C7 as a handle of sorts when doing so. Once lined up, secure the board to the case using the four included motherboard screws. At this point, let's start wiring a few of the smaller cables included with the front I.O. of the Node 202. A cable management guide you can check out, by the way, is right here. I recommend starting with the smaller cables first and working your way up to the largest ones. You'll first want your HD audio and USB 3.0 cables as well as the power LED and power switch wires that are pre-routed from the front panel. Locate the header marked HD audio and connect the appropriate cable. Use the missing pin as a guide. Do the same for the USB 3.0 header, use the indentions to ensure proper orientation in this case. The front panel connections, only the power LED and power switch in this case, should be installed here. Labels are printed on the motherboard but don't hesitate to refer to the motherboard manual if you're unsure. This step is perhaps the most difficult because the connections themselves are so small. Let's connect the larger motherboard cables next. The 8-pin CPU cable should be run along the side of the motherboard and secured with zip ties where necessary to ensure a clean aesthetic. This header is keyed, but you can also line up the latches with the indention on the header itself. Lastly, tackle the 24-pin, same process as before, cable manage as you go. SSD installation is next. Remove the drive bracket, align the four holes at the bottom of the drive with those on the bracket, and secure the drive using four included drive screws. They should be the same size as the ones used to mount the motherboard. Be sure the SATA hubs are facing the inside of the case. Connect a SATA cable that looks something like this to the smaller hub on the drive. The ASRock Fatality motherboard comes with a few black SATA cables that you can use. Also connect SATA power from a cable sprouting from the power supply. You want to run both of of these cables through the cutout in the middle of the case. Now connect the opposite end of the smaller SATA cable to a hub on the motherboard. Either of the two closest to the 24 pin will do. You should hear a click when it's fastened properly. The last cable you need to run is the PCIe power cable. Funnel this through the same center cutout to the left side of the case. This one will provide our graphics card with the additional power it needs. The last major step is graphics card installation, although for a PC like this, you could probably get by without a graphics card if gaming isn't a top priority. Start by prepping the PCI riser card. This larger extension should be inserted first. Pull back on the motherboard's lever before insertion. It should snap into place. Screw this into the case frame as well, and then connect the smaller extension. Remove the two slot covers in the back of the Fractal Node 202 and prep your graphics card for installation. Slide the card into the smaller extension protruding through the frame and use the included support beam to hold the card upright. It's not necessary, but it makes things look a bit nicer. Use the screws from the two slot covers to fasten the RX480 to the chassis. Lastly, connect a 6-pin cable you previously routed over here to the 6-pin header on the graphics card. If your card has an 8-pin instead, use the additional two wires from the PSU PCIe cable as well. Repeat if you have another 6 or 8 pin on board. Now make sure no wires are interfering with the graphics card and CPU fans. Zip ties are your best friend in scenarios like this. Even though you won't see much of this case's insides when the top is on, it doesn't hurt to keep things nice and tidy in here. For the finishing touch, reinsert the top case cover, gently flip the entire thing over, and secure it with the four screws you previously removed. Congratulations! <music>
probably could have overclocked it a bit more, maybe 4.6 or 4.7 gigahertz, but I was worried about temperatures. It's a very constrictive case and the cooler is quite small. Ida 64 temps never pass 75C after about 30 minutes. I'm comfortable with that. The fans are very quiet even under load. Power consumption is very low thanks to state-of-the-art architecture, and the PC as a whole is as portable as a next-gen console, perhaps its coolest trait. There's a lizard on the floor. He's looking right at me. I guess I just, I'll just leave him in here. He's not hurting anybody. If anything, he's going to kill the other things that might be in here. Anyway, if you appreciate, it's really weird. He's still staring right at me. If you appreciated this build guide, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Be sure to share this video with as many friends as you possibly can, especially those who are interested in building small form factor PCs. Let's say you have a friend named Andy who's, I don't know, been playing consoles his whole life. You can tell Andy he can build a PC that's similar in size to the console he's currently gaming on, granted for about three times the price. This build was about 900 bucks, all the parts included. Uh, but it'll pack a huge punch, a much bigger punch than what his console's currently punching. Uh, that, did that make sense? I don't know. I'm still kind of mesmerized by the lizard here. Uh, that's it. I'm going to end the video and I'm going to do something about the lizard. I'll take a picture of him and put him on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter if you want to see a picture of a random lizard. It's probably the worst uh, marketing tool I've ever used to advertise Twitter. <laughs> this is Salazar Studio. Thanks for building with us. Okay, I'm going to get the lizard now.